Hi and welcome to this uh, episode of Virtual Bridge. Um, today we've got Craig Brown from the University of Glasgow talking about micro credentials in the time of COVID. Um, so I'll put you in the, the capable hands of Craig. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, can everyone see this okay? Perfect. Yep. Excellent. Okay, so good morning everyone. My name is Craig Brown. I'm currently a Learning Innovation Officer at the University of Glasgow in the Learning Innovation Support Unit. Uh, I'm on secondment from the School of Law for um, 18 months and part of my remit is to help upskill the university but also to help uh, develop micro-credential courses and MOOC courses for the university. So basically what a micro-credential is, is we use the FutureLearn platform and a micro-credential is an upskilling course. It's based at master's level and it's worth 10 master's credits. Um, the course itself lasts for 10 weeks um, and there can be between one and two assessments. Everything is um, delivered online and is made up of um, your sort of usual fare of online delivery of uh, text, media, be it audio, uh, video, and um, some individual sort of um, self-evaluation steps, things like quiz, peer assessment, these kind of things. So when we started off, we had uh, seven courses that we had to develop. Um, these courses, the participants were made up of people who were self-financing and also there was other um, places which were funded by the Scottish Government and their move to upskill um, people. This was all decided before COVID struck and it was everything was to be made available by July 2020. And the reason I've got July 2020 exclamation marks is that by the time I got brought onto this project, we were in a really tight turnaround. I get um, invited to uh, participate or apply for the secondment in February. Um, and I, the secondment itself wasn't starting until April. So basically, as you can imagine, there was quite a tight turnaround. There was myself and another colleague um, who were the two uh, developers for these courses. So COVID cometh. So basically, to add to the mix, no longer, no, no sooner rather had I decided that I was going to take the secondment, um, COVID struck and everything went into lockdown. Um, so I, at this point, I actually hadn't started my secondment. I was still working for the School of Law in Glasgow. I was also doing my job, but I was also covering for our uh, head of professional services who had left and were in the process of uh, recruiting for a new one who, Again, they weren't due to start until the end of March. So suddenly we went from um, developing these micro-credentials because I'd kind of negotiated, although I wasn't starting straight away, that I would gradually move in to my secondment. So I had all these kind of meetings in my diary uh, to meet face-to-face -to, -face to do things uh, such as course design. One of the other things we had is we have a, a studio in Glasgow where we do all our audio and video recordings. And again, that was now closed. So the academics who I was working with had suddenly gone from having these facilities where they would just turn up with their script, uh, have an auto queue, deliver what they need to do and disappear and all video would be edited for them. So we then suddenly found ourselves all working remotely. I was fortunate in that although I hadn't been told that the university was going to close. Um, I had a kind of inkling, so I'd started um, taking kit home with me so that I would be in a situation that if I had to suddenly start working remotely, I could do. But even then, it took me, it was a further month and a half before I actually got my desktop computer home. So I had various um, setups of stuff that uh, fortunately my wife had let me keep in the attic all these kind of things if you've ever found yourself in a situation where you think that will come in handy, whereas there's somebody else who's permanently trying to ask you to throw stuff out. So I was quite smug in some respects that I'd held on to all these things like external monitors, various cables, etc., cetera, um, that I'd been under pressure to get rid of. So the goalpost has been seriously changed. We'd found ourselves 
initially in a very, very tight turnaround. And then on top of that, we suddenly found ourselves all working remotely um, with various other uh, impacts on our working life. Um, as you can imagine, um, with the job that I do, suddenly my skills became very much in demand. So the decision time was, could we still go ahead and deliver these seven micro-credential courses? Um, would we have the resource? Would we have the capacity? Uh, not just from us, the uh, technologists supporting uh, the academics, but the academics themselves as well. Um, one of the first decisions that Glasgow took was that all assessment, all exams were going to go online for the diet in April. Um, so as you can imagine, that put quite a bit of strain on both academics and all the learning technologists within the university. So the decision was, let's do it. Um, my um, line manager decided that we could do it. It still was possible. We had a bit of a frank conversation, a few frank meetings with our various academic teams. And we decided that, yeah, it was possible we could do it, but we would have to um, manage expectations. We decided to keep the original timeline. Um, it had been talked about, did we delay the launch of these micro-credentials? Did we put them back? Did we maybe wait until September to launch them instead of launching them in July? But we felt that the timing that had been originally decided, um, because micro-credentials are basically aimed at people uh, in the workplace. The other thing was as well, that out of the seven micro-credentials, five were based in um, MVLS, so our medical faculty, uh, our medical school. Um, and the big concern was that the courses, the, the, I suppose the people, our audience that these were aimed at would find themselves under a lot more pressure just to do with the uh, COVID pandemic and would they still be wanting to commit themselves to learning during it. So once we'd had all these kind of frank conversations, we decided that all seven courses would go ahead and we would stick to the original timeline. We then realised that we were going to have to uh, upskill staff to work remotely. Um, we were going to have to rely on them to create their own media. Whereas when they'd signed up and had agreed to do these micro-credentials, a lot of it was going to be provided for them, where they would be taken into the studio on campus and um, all recording, all media would be done there. We were going to have to re uh, rely on them doing it at home. The other thing as well was we did appreciate that just given the circumstance, we would all have additional workload. As I said earlier on, I was pulled in to help uh, upskill um, so that all exams could be delivered online, uh, which was quite a major task um, from training staff uh, remotely uh, to set up quite a lot of the uh, exams themselves. One of the, the the things that happened to me, which was a bit unfortunate, was I was supposed to get backfilled uh, for the School of Law, but because of the timing, um, during the point where the law school were going to recruit to backfill me, um, COVID hit and there was a immediate stop to all recruitment at the university, uh, which meant that I had to kind of juggle two jobs, so to speak. Uh, again, I was managing expectations of what physically I could do, but on a plus side, I wasn't going out because we were in lockdown, so I had extra time and I no longer had a two hour sort of commute as part of my work day. The other thing that was going to be the first challenge was the actual course design. Um, we tend to do course design sessions where we get all the academics together. We use um, the ABC um, sort of system of course design that UCL developed. It's a kind of, um, it's kind of, kind of evolved that a bit, but it's pretty much the, the general ethos of that, where we start with a massive uh, A3 sort of chart and we start working out the content, we post it notes and sort of play about with it to see what, how the course is going to flow. So obviously that was going to be one of the, 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 the biggest concerns. And again, as I've already said, the media creation was really going to be um, something that we're going to be up against uh, to do. So as I said earlier on, the course design, we ended up using a bit of software called Miro. Um, and basically it's a kind of virtual whiteboard application. There's a good chance that some of you already have experience of working with it. And uh, my line manager, uh, John Kerr, created this template. 
um, and it meant that we could do it virtually. So we just had a Zoom session where I was in charge of the Miro board and we started uh, building it remotely and putting it together. The other good thing about Miro as well is you can um, share it. Uh, so I, I basically decided to take the decision that I was just going to have it as read only, but it meant that um, after the session, we could go back, review it, and feedback on it. So this is pretty much how we went about our course design. Um, to be honest, it's something I would use again, even uh, when we hopefully not too distant future come out of um, the sort of socially distancing. Um, I found it really helpful. I've also found that going from the sort of, as I said before, the, the sort of physical massive bit of paper with the post-it notes on it, where you're taking multiple photographs of it, to go to something like this, which is and can be a living document. And as I get a bit more confident with it, I'll probably give um, the academics I was working with um, right access to it as well, so they can go in and make changes themselves. But as I say, it's a bit of software called Miro, and I highly recommend it, not just for this, but for I've used it now for um, various other sort of systems of course design too, and it, it just makes things a lot easier. So the media creation, this was always going to be the biggest challenge, I felt. Um, the first thing to do was to have a kind of discussion um, where I try to ascertain what bits of kit people had at home. Um, again, one of the, the, the issues was that a lot of people had basically just left and, you know, some people were working with tablets, some people were working with um, desktop computers, some people were working with laptops. It, it tended to be whatever they had at hand or whatever they could carry when they realised they were going to have to start home working. It kind of got better um, during the process of um, the, the course creation, simply because the university worked in a sort of socially um, distanced visits, where you could go in and you could uh, sign up for time slots, where you could go into your office and you could pick up bits of kit. Um, there was also budgets made available for things like external microphones and webcams, because one of the things that you just assume is that everybody will have access to a camera on their computer. And I finally kind of found out that that wasn't always the case. And also it wasn't always the case that people had a decent microphone. Um, we also went about um, creating guides and to sort of doing sort of training sessions on how to uh, upskill staff. So just even simple things about how to create a space where they could record so they weren't getting a lot of background noise. Um, you know, how to script yourself, various things to put uh, reminders around your room and a bit, even in a bit of paper so that you're looking at the camera when you're talking, you weren't sort of constantly looking down. Also, even um, just thinking about some of the sessions that you're going to do as videos, they could just simply be done as uh, audio. Um, and again, a lot of the time we were relying on the, the good old uh, PowerPoint with sort of slides, shows uh, and images uh, with a background audio. So below, as I say, is creative edits. We basically went round to find out things that we, um, had been recorded before, uh, sites where we had um, content that we could use through Creative Comms, all these kind of things uh, to try and create um, engaging media. The other thing that we did as well was we also put in a disclaimer in our courses, just a minor disclaimer, just to say to the students, that the majority, if not all, of the media created had been created during lockdown. So we'd relied on um, whatever equipment people had to hand. One of the limitations we found quite early on was some of our courses, we had interview steps and we just assumed that we'd be able to use Zoom. But what we, we did find was again, that these sort of sessions could be quite negatively affected uh, to do with um, bandwidth and uh, people's connection. Uh, we also, one of the things that I found that I didn't realize was that Zoom kind of drops down to the lowest connection uh, so that it works for everyone. So if you have someone in a fantastic connection, that will still drop down to, to sort of mirror the person who's on the, the, the sort of poorer. So one of the things we did suggest to people was that when they were carrying out the, uh, if they were doing an interview, 
is um, if the person had a phone, if they could record themselves on their phone as well and give us the audio from the phone. And a lot of the time we found that that audio was actually a higher quality than the Zoom recording. And we also, the good thing was we could also go back to our um, academics and sometimes what they would do is they'd do a separate Zoom recording themselves um, where they just asked the questions and it meant that we could uh, edit it all together to get a sort of fairly decent quality recording. It still wasn't brilliant in some res respects and we're hopefully rerunning these uh, micro-credentials in uh, January and I'm hoping that some of the media will be able to recreate and hopefully make better um, just with what we've learned but also hopefully uh, lockdown, lockdown rather won't be quite as extreme. We also had um, two media interns that we were uh, allowed to work with, but they kind of, and it's not um, a criticism of the two interns because they were very good, but both ended up having to go home, one in the United States and one over to Ireland. And again, we had issues with um, connection speeds. Also, they went from being able to use, um, they both uh, are students of, um, theatre and media at the University of Glasgow. So the whole plan was that they were going to use university systems to do edits. So they went from having really decent kit to basically having laptops and tablets. So they were really limited to what they could do. And sometimes I found that we actually had to go in afterwards and re-edit some of the stuff they did. And again, that's no criticism of them. It was just they were really limited um, by what was available to them. And also with uh, one of them, uh, she ended up back in the United States. It made it actually quite difficult to arrange meetings on occasion uh, for catching up. So on a plus point, we did it. And I used to, I get kind of get slagged off because we would um, have team meetings once a week. Sometimes we'd use Zoom, sometimes we'd use Microsoft Teams. And I'd always start off, I was seemingly a motivational speaker which when you're listening to this presentation is probably hard to, to, to imagine, but I used to always sort of start off with, you know, we are doing really well given the situation that we find ourselves in. And as I say, there's certain things about these courses that I could be slightly critical of, that I don't like, that kind of annoy me. But I think regardless of the situation you do, we all do, you know, any job that we do, we create something. Um, you'll always be critical. You'll always be able to hone in on the things that aren't quite right or quite as the way you want them to do. But in the main, and I would say that the student feedback has been uh, pretty much all positive. Um, the other thing as well that I should have probably said earlier is we are one of the first um, universities to do micro-credentials on the FutureLearn platform. So not only we, we kind of have trailblazers, we were kind of learning and so were FutureLearn as well. And some of the issues that we actually had weren't to do with COVID. It was just to do with limitations of the platform that hadn't been thought about or realized before. Um, because basically, if you've got any experience with FutureLearn, they are foremost a MOOC provider. And basically the micro-credential platform is a, the way it's built is a collection of MOOCs that create the micro-credential itself under a, a kind of um, framework network. Um, so there, there's a kind of, um, they're collected together, but the issue, I mean, one of the first issues we had was that, um, one, for example, one of the micro-credentials I work in, it's four MOOCs that make up the micro-credential. Um, and each of the separate courses starts from one. So it meant that I, when I was developing the course, I had four steps that were called 1.1. So it created a lot of confusion and it's also created a bit of confusion with students as well as they work through that we actually have to get a bit more information instead of them just saying, um, you know, I was looking at step 2.3 and I'm not sure about this. We actually have to sometimes go back and say, well, I could actually refer to two of these. So there's things like that. Also, there's no assessment option on the FutureLearn platform itself. Um, for essay-based submission. So not only did we have to enroll our students in this, we also had to enroll them in Moodle as well. And we, the way it worked, we couldn't get it as a single sign-on. So as you can imagine, you suddenly have students with two separate sets of credentials to get anywhere. 
so it made things all the more difficult. Also, even just um, enrolling students in the first instance um, was one of the sort of biggest hurdles we kind of had. But after all that, kind of get taken care care of, and we kind of worked through it. As I say, the the, the process has been pretty positive. Um, we're now in the final week, so we're now in week ten of our first run of micro credentials. And as I say, the feedback from students in the main has been positive. I would say that in some respects, I think they have been understanding of some of the media. Um, although it is usable, um, and I'm glad we did put the sort of slight disclaimer into it, but the fact that under the circumstances we managed to get seven of these up and running um, and enrolled, um, I think we did, we did well. So just really to, to do a bit of a, a sort of summary and a bit of a sum up, um, talk about the sort of highs and lows. I mean, from my point of view, it was a pretty much a positive experience. There was a couple of weekends working and a, a couple of late shifts into the evening to get stuff done. And what we found was sort of a lot, and it's the same with most course development, especially online courses, is you tend to find that a lot of the, 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 the real sort of involved stuff happens towards the end. Um, when you're sort of having the sort of final push to get content, to get content ready, to get, get it published. So the high for me was um, we got seven courses live, enrolled, uh, students learning. Um, and yeah, so at certain times I didn't think it was going to happen. I felt we were really up against it and we were, was a few meetings with uh, the teams that I was working with that ended up as almost sort of semi uh, therapy sessions because not only did we have this going on with various other things going on both professionally and in a sort of personal basis um, with COVID affecting people in different ways. Um, I would say that a, a real positive is that I learned a lot of skills uh, through necessity. Um, I learned a lot more about video and audit audio editing that I didn't know before. Um, also various applications that I'd never used before that I found for free. Um, we also became quite a good community of passing on hints and tips and upskilling each other. Um, staff generally found that um, they were in a much better position for the start of this academic year. Um, for all the academic staff that are involved in have all said to me, the, the skills that they learned were transferable into what they're now doing and they're now faced with. So from that point of view, it was a really valuable experience for them. At the time, there was a fair bit of resistance because, you know, if I'd heard we didn't sign up for this mentioned once, I probably heard it mentioned a hundred times, especially when it came to the media creation. Um, it did mean, especially at the start, there was a few times where I had to go back to people uh, who'd presented me with stuff that they thought was fantastic to say um, in a nice way, we can't use it. Um, also, there was some interesting sort of cinematography going on uh, to the point where subtly you had to say, I think this would be really good uh, if we just put images and slides over the top uh, without hurting people's feelings. Um, as I said, late night, and weekend work. It's a crazy final edit. The way these courses work is there's an editing process with Future Learn. So our courses launched towards the end of July, but we had to have them ready for the beginning of July for quality assurance purposes. One of the issues we found as well was that we felt that the courses were being um, assessed as if they were MOOCs as opposed to a master's level course. So that sort of added to that kind of workload where there was a lot of negotiation going on where we'd been sort of recommended changes which we were going back and saying that the, these changes aren't suitable. As I said earlier on, the platform itself, there was a few issues with it. None of them were deal breakers, but some of them did take sort of workarounds. One of the ones that we're still having an issue with is uh, communication with students. Um, because if you understand how a MOOC works and there's various there's discussion steps, there's also you can comment on any other step, but actually trying to get a general communication to a student is quite difficult. The way it works in Future Learn, the general um, communications rather come out once a week. It's a weekly email, but basically therefore, you know, we covered this last week and this is what we're going to look at this week. 
but to try and get out um, very sort of specific feedback. And another thing with these emails as well is you um, front load them. So you have your 10 emails good to go when your course starts. So there was quite a lot of resistance from academics who felt that they wanted their emails to be a bit more reactionary to what was actually going on. So we did find that you can send out uh, supplementary emails, but the problem with these is they have to go through uh, an edit process. So basically you send your email, you put it ready to go out, and then someone from uh, FutureLearn has to um, basically allow it to go out. They, they're the sort of last person that reads it and sends it out. So it could mean that uh, it could take about a day turnaround to get our communication out. And also nobody works over the weekend. So if you wanted something on this was quite important to do maybe with an assessment that was due at the weekend on a Sunday night or something and left it too late, you were really up against it to try and get it uh, sent out. Again, these are all kind of learning things and I'm not being negative against Future Learn or the platform itself, but because this was the kind of first run of this particular style of course, it did flag up um, some of the limitations. And as I said before, um, some of the media will probably need to redo before our second run in January. Um, just from a sort of quality point of view, it's not the best, it's not brilliant. Um, it's usable and no students haven't basically responded negatively to it but i think it's more a case of you kind of know and um, when we look at other courses that they've put together that uh, what we've done and um, what we're capable of doing in sort of better and uh, more reasonable situations but as i said earlier in the main it was a positive experience and it has had the positive impact on staff involved that um, it's kind of shown them what they can do. And what also worked as well was that um, a lot of the academics actually repurposed some of the stuff that they'd done uh, for the micro-credential courses to use it for their um, undergraduate and postgraduate courses, um, some of the media that they created. Um, and as I say, it was mainly the skills that they've learned uh, to how to deal with people um, in a purely online environment. And that's me. So, any questions? That was great, Craig. Thank you very much for that. Um, just a, a couple of questions. How many students have been through the are, are currently going through the micro credential courses just now? Um, I knew I was going to get asked that, and I should have probably come better prepared. But it is in the hundreds. Oh, um, the I can tell you one course we did an introduction to health service management and. We started off with uh, over 100 learners. Um, I think, speaking to the, the, the course team, we're looking at 90 of them doing the final submission. Uh, so there was two submissions in that course. We had 95 for the first one, and we're down to 90 for the final one. Okay. Um, is, the, is the model to deliver that, or are you hoping to tempt them into further education within the university? It's, it's a bit of both. Um, it's, they're there to sort of stand alone, but obviously it is a kind of marketing exercise. And we're also uh, looking at how these micro-credentials will fit into sort of further, further study. At the moment, they are kind of standalone. The credits don't count to any of the existing master's courses at Glasgow. But I think that the plan is that that eventually will be part, you know, you'll be able to miss out one module or two modules if yeah. you've already done this. Definitely, especially if you can say at the end of it, you're five percent of the way towards a master's. That's that, <laughs> that, that, that's it. That, I mean, the other uh, issue we had was we were worried about the attrition rate because we had a lot of, as I say, funded places. So there was a lot of free places, and I think the um, fear was from an early stage that because it was free, people would wouldn't have the same sort of commitment to it. Mm -hmm. um, but in the main, it's been pretty good. I mean, we have sort of learned lessons that we were going to um, try and have a bit more action a lot quicker by people who'd signed up to go through the actual enrollment process uh, because we had quite a big waiting list and quite a few people on the waiting list missed out uh, with people, you know, at the last minute not enrolling and it was too late for us to, to, to open up to these people. So as I say, it's, it has been even quite a learning process from that. Anyone else got any questions? Yes, um, 
how did you keep track of the students and, and you know, what sort of assessments were, did you do kind of as the course progressed or was it just a kind of end of course assessment? Um, there was sort of keeping track and um, there's quite a lot of discussion steps to try and keep um, so opportunities for feedback. Um, the sort of progress were things like um, you were kind of restricted to things in the platform itself to stuff like apart from um, case studies and re, re, you know relying on students feeding back in these kind of steps to um, self-assessment quizzes we did put a sort of stipulation that there'd be a sort of a formative and a summative assignment so the, the, the previous course I talked about they had a the, the assessment itself uh, split over and sort of 25, 75%. So after sort of week five, they had a, a short assessment, um, which was just a, it was a written assessment that was submitted into Moodle. And uh, this week they have a, a, a larger assessment. Okay, thanks. Have you involved the, the, the students in the creation of the content? Um, and if, if so, how did that go? Um, no. no. <laughs> um, although we are, uh, just again, I think it was more to do with the way things things worked out. Um, but what we are doing is we're doing quite a lot of uh, feedback uh, sessions. Um, Future Learn do have a sort of standard questionnaire that gets, end of course questionnaire that gets filled out. Um, also, we've got quite a lot of statistics to show um, even participation in steps. So again, it's kind of limited what you can do with that, but what we plan to do, and again, um, I'm, I'm kind of using the, the health service introduction to management health service as an example, but they actually um, set up a, a WhatsApp group um, because they just felt that the FutureLearn platform kind of limited them uh, communication for sort of free communication. And they've used that for um, focus on students and uh, Funnily enough, I just came out of a meeting with them and we were starting to go through some of the feedback um, from the students and it's actually really good and it will probably uh, help um, shape the second run of the course um, uh, to do with even just some of the support structure to some of the content and even what students felt was that the course really picked up pace in the last sort of three weeks and they felt that it could have been a bit more staggered um throughout so that was all, all all good stuff and interesting so i suppose that if that sort of answers your question james uh, i suppose that's the kind of input we'll have from our students for the next run um so i suppose that's that's it for this week's virtual bridge then so um thank you very much craig and thank you everybody else Thanks,